the last 52 days. Okay, we're going to call the meeting to order for January 16th. Um, roll call. Ms. Snell. Here. Ms. Matoye. Here. Ms. Flores absent. Mr. Davenport. Here. Ms. Franco. Here. Ms. Black. Here. Ms. Yelsey. Here. Dr. Navarro. Here. Okay, so you want to read? This is an opportunity for the public to address the board on closed session agenda items only. Each speaker has three minutes to address the board and speakers may not cede unused time to other speakers. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. Okay, um, Nicholas Sticks. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I just want to um, give you a brief update um, regarding our negotiations um, of the calendar. So we have given a counter proposal to the district, and that proposal indicates that we will be accepting a traditional calendar for 1920, and we will defer to our reopener negotiations, which we hope to um, have commenced um, very soon the decision of a traditional versus a collegiate calendar for 2021. I just want to explain because I know that you are aware that there is a recommendation from the calendar committee um, regarding a collegiate calendar for 2021. I just want to inform you that we're very concerned um, about that um, recommendation um, as it relates to um, the process. We know that everyone worked very hard you know, um, in those meetings that many issues um, were brought up, um, including, you know, um, issues related to facilities. Since that time, we've gotten information about the air conditioning schedule, which was um, of major concern. Also, other um, issues that impact and um, uh, secondary students and trying to um, determine what type of calendar would best meet um, those needs and those um, interests. I've given you a copy of the agendas which really point out the process problem. So there are a number of uh, agendas that you have um, before you, and there is no mention of a uh, calendar for the 2021 um, unit member service calendar year um, until about the fifth meeting. So at that fifth meeting, which took place on December 6th, is the first time the um, this design, the 2021 collegiate calendar, um, was brought up in those um, meetings. So we have a very um, big concern regarding the process, as well as the scope and the original charge of the calendar committee. So um, it really becomes frustrating because the reason that we have policies and procedures and processes in, in place is so that you know we don't get ahead of ourselves. And um, we are happy to um, have a full discussion of this calendar when we resume our um, negotiations with the district. So just wanted to make you um, aware of that. Also, just uh, is there a question related to the calendar? I just want to give another um, brief update. I also sent to you, all of you, an email. I was asked to send you an email regarding a Orange County Superior Court decision regarding one of our members, Leanne Fister. The district filed a writ of mandate to um, um, regarding a underlying decision that um, was made to bring her back to work or to reinstate her employment. The district filed the writ and the court decided um, in the employee's favor on that writ. And we just ask that you give that your full consideration today. Thank you. Thank you. Madam President, uh, be before mm -hmm. we leave, uh, mm -hmm. we actually have two members that sat on the calendar committee. And uh, perhaps uh, start with Ms. Olson. Perhaps they'd like to add some clarifying information about the process and why the decision was made and how it evolved. Great, thank you. Certainly, good evening. Uh, as you have in front of you um, the agendas that were created as we went through the process to look at our calendars, what the agendas don't share with you are the comments and the input from the calendar committee. So in our first meeting, uh, September 27th, there was conversations regarding um, actually pushing out farther than 1920. It was charted. Um, some of the concerns were, oh, maybe this is too fast. Um, what is the timeline? And so it was brought up um, as one of the comments at that point, at that meeting. Uh, then as you 
go through um, the agenda, you'll see the term commencing 2019-20. Um, which was from the agreement directly. And so again, as we looked at the agreement, and the agreement talks about a traditional, um, that the traditional sequence is coming forward on a three-year cycle, and that we were looking, that the 1819 had been resolved, and that we are looking at collegiate calendar commencing 1920, but it wasn't solely only about 1920, it was the interpretation. So as we went through the, the, the committee meetings, um, it actually then came up again November 20th when we were talking about the implementation. We had conversations around the HVAC plan. Was there enough time? Uh, we even looked at how long is um, the summer, that shortened summer, and it turns out that in 2021 it's short, it, it's seven weeks versus, uh, sorry, eight weeks, it's a eight weeks versus nine weeks, whereas if we had started actually in 1920, it would have been um, a seven week summer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we started to have those conversations. There, there were little pieces of it, and then it really came out in the November 20th, which then, um, led to, excuse me, on November 27th, there was some conversation. It really <coughs> came to um, further conversation on the 29th. I had my dates mixed mm -hmm. up there. And then that is why you then see it actually on the agenda for December 6th, in which we were designing the program and looking at the actual instructional days and where they're placed. Dr. Sir, is there anything you'd like to add? I know you were also part of the team. Uh, what I would say is that uh, the uh, committee itself uh, was um, uh, very, very involved. A lot of time and effort was put into this, and as more information became clear in regards to air conditioning, the concern of air conditioning was a major part of the conversation along with looking at what are the benefits for students. So it was that discussion, and we were, t we were talking about those two things. It was part of our dialogues, just like uh, uh, Mrs. Olson said, it was charted um, from the members of the committee, the concept of uh, commencing in 2021, and it was a healthy dialogue. I mean, there's a lot of brainstorming and a lot of time, a lot of people working really hard to try to come to a recommendation, and after uh, many meetings, we, we, were, we were able to get there, but it was really the piece in regards to, we want to have some confidence around the schedule for air conditioning, and we would also like to um, be able to provide the benefit to students, which is to move to a collegiate calendar. So it was those two pieces that led us ultimately to the 2021 recommendation. Dr. Barmeister, I know you were in there too. I don't want to uh, give you short shrift here. Is there anything you'd like to add? Just to reiterate what Dr. Sir said is, is the committee felt that the benefits of the collegiate calendar, they wanted to go to a collegiate calendar, but because of the input of a lot of the different committee members, Everybody agreed that moving it to, well, not everybody, but the majority agreed to moving it to 2021 uh, was in the best interest of our kids and our students and staff. Okay, good. Sounds like the process worked. Okay, so I guess we'll retire into closed session. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Welcome everyone, I'm glad you could make it tonight. Um, we would like to start with the opening ceremonies and um, we'll have Rachel Krakorian Kr uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, the next order is uh, adoption of the agenda. Move adoption of the agenda. Second. <coughs> And I would like to add, um, we're going to, I would like to uh, adjourn the meeting tonight in the memory of Jess Gilman. I, uh, I think everybody, 
in this room probably knew him. Um, he was a 28-year police veteran, and he spent 12 years at Newport Mesa as a uh, resource officer. Um, he worked at the middle schools, elementary schools, high schools mostly. Um, he was a mentor, he was a protector, and he was an educator. Um, he is really, really going to be missed, and uh, a couple of um, our uh, staff went to, his funeral was today up in Los Angeles. A couple of our staff went to the funeral. It was very well attended by um, educators, um, students, community, and of course the police department. So um, we will be adjourning tonight in his honor. Mrs. Snell? Yes. I would also like to add to that, okay. um, to also adjourn it in the name of Mary Zilgut, who is a longtime teacher in our district, who after she retired continued to volunteer her services um, at Davis Magnet School. Mm -hmm. She worked for the district after retirement, SELT testing district-wide, and also worked diligently with the Newport Mesa Schools Foundation, and she passed in our last week mm -hmm. also. So mm -hmm. if we can do a two-name mm -hmm. adjournment, I would appreciate that. Okay. Um, so all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, next is the adoption of the minutes from December 11th, December 19th, January 11th. Move, Move adoption. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And next, uh, introduction of new staff. For Leo, with Leona. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Uh, it's my pleasure tonight to introduce and welcome our newest member to the management team. Um, so if I could have Kristen Henry join us at, join us mm -hmm. at the podium. Um, Kristen has an extensive background in special education, particularly in the area of psychology. In fact, she did her master's in neuropsychology. For the last couple of years, she has been the program specialist of um, overseeing mental health in Santa Ana and coordinating the services for students within that realm, um, including that of outside, outside services. She's also worked as a, psychi a psychiatrist. <laughs> Have um, a psychologist, <laughs> as well as a lead psychologist with the Ocean View School District, mm -hmm. and in that role, she was instrumental in developing an elementary emotionally disturbed pro or program for students with emotion that who are emotionally disturbed. She's provided staff development not only for staff, but she also provides staff development for other districts within their SALPA, and she comes to us with recommendations. She is highly respected for her knowledge as well as her ability to problem solve with staff um, meeting the needs of our meeting needs of students. So Kristen, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me here tonight, President Snell and board members, as well as Dr. Navarro and members of cabinet. And thank you especially for the opportunity to serve in the community. I am ecstatic. Um, I was going to tell you a little bit about myself, but you did such a great job in <laughs> a promotion as a psychiatrist, so that's fantastic. Um, but um, I wanted to also just mention that I am here tonight with my family, my oh, husband good. of 19 years, Martin. Stand up. Stand up, Stand up Martin. Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> and my two daughters, our two daughters, Emma and Eden. Yay. Come on, girls. Stand up. <laughs> So everything in my life that I've done that's been worthwhile or that I'm proud of has been a direct result of, of having those three in my life. Um, I started back to school when Emma, my firstborn, was, was first born mm. and um, started my master's in education at that time. And I completed my master's when Eden came along. I wore her in the baby Bjorn with Emma's hand <laughs> as we delivered my thesis <coughs> paper to oh, my wow. advisor. Um, and then I went on to be a school psychologist, like Ms. Olson talked about, and then the lead psychologist in Ocean View, and then to Santa Ana for three years as the mental health program specialist, um, earning my uh, diploma in school neuropsychology and also completing um, my administrative credential during mm -hmm. that time. Um, so what brought me to Newport Mesa 
um, was what brings me to everything, which is a deep Google search um, <laughs> as I heard about the position and I started to investigate um, as I would if I were ordering a pizza or buying a new car, <laughs> finding everything out that I could um, about this district. And I was immediately impressed with a lot of the initiatives um, with uh, the academic um, pursuit of the new curriculum and the intervention. Um, also, the, the mental health program I'd actually heard about years ago with a lot of the innovation that, that you guys were doing. And um, I, I ultimately really felt connected when I read more about the, the mission and the vision and the, the belief statements of the district. There were so many terms that I had used in my own personal mission and vision, things like teaching the whole child mm -hmm. and that all students would learn and be supported, and respecting diversity, building community, including parents, just the things that are so critical to me. Um, so that brought me here to my interview, and from the very first phone call that I received to uh, the processes and human resources when I was brought on board, and in benefits, and um, Candy's support just um, already, just in this short week that I've been working in the district, has really, um, has showed me that these weren't just words <coughs> on the internet. This was, this was the truth. So again, I'm <coughs> grateful and thankful um, for this opportunity to grow and, and really serve within this community. Well, well, welcome. Thank you, thank thank you. you. so thank much. You. Welcome. <laughs> Okay, um, and now we're going to is recognition. Um, Russell and Kirk. And Kirk. All right, I'm going to defer the honors to Dr. Baumeister. Okay. President Snell, members of the board, uh, Dr. Navarro, cabinet members, and distinguished guests, we continue tonight with our recognizing CIF championship teams and individuals, and tonight we have both a team championship for a CIF and an individual championship. And so at this time, I'd like to call up Corona Del Mar Principal Kathy Scott and Athletic Director Don Grable to tell us about the Corona Del Mar girls' tennis season, which was truly a magical and memorable season. So good evening, President Snell, members of the board, and Dr. Navarro, and cabinet members as well. Uh, and on behalf of the CDM high school community, we do thank you for tonight's special recognition of the phenomenal season our girls' tennis team had. So in uh, the interest of time, I'm going to ask our athletic director, uh, Don Grable, to come forward and share about what an amazing season they had. And we're so very proud of them. And I can assure you these are not only stellar athletes, but amazing young ladies off the court as well. So we're very proud of what they've represented. CDM. So, Coach Grable. Good evening. Our girls play in the toughest girls tennis league in Southern California, the Pacific Coast League, in which five of the schools are traditionally rated in the top 10 of Orange County. Additionally, we schedule as many other top teams in the county and surrounding Southern California area as possible in order to compete against the very best. This was a very special season since we finished with an undefeated overall record of 26 wins and zero losses wow. and a league record of 10 and zero. In so doing, our team won the CIF Southern Section Division I Championship, which is the highest division to represent 580 high schools in, in the Southern Section. Wow. From there, we went on to the Southern California Regional Tournament in which we also finished as champions. And as if that was not enough, we had two doubles teams advance all the way to the quarterfinals of the CIF Southern Section Individuals Tournament. And one of our singles players, senior Danielle Wilson, became the singles champion. All of these accomplishments resulted in five of our girls being named to the all-county team and Danielle being selected as the Orange County Girls Tennis Player of the Year. Aside from doing so well on the court, these girls were amazing teammates to each other and showed great character and sportsmanship throughout the season. And in short, they represented our school with class, dignity, and amazing skill. And we're very proud of all the hard work that went into these worthy accomplishments. So I'd like to, at this time, bring up head coach Jamie Gresh so that he can introduce all of the girls.
Uh, I'd like to start with the uh, CIF Southern Girls Tennis Individual Champion, which is Danielle Wilson. Uh, senior Annika Bassi. Is there. A junior, Christina <laughs> Evloeva. Senior, Emily Freeman. Freshman, Lauren Friedman. Senior, Brooke Henderson. Freshman Reese Kennerson. <laughs> Senior Paulina Laredo. <laughs> Junior Roxanne McKenzie. <laughs> Junior Dylan Metesky. <laughs> Junior Isabella McKinney. Junior Shea Northrup. <laughs> Sophomore Ashley Thomas. <laughs> and that is the entire team for Corona Del Mar. Just on behalf of the board, I know you guys want to sneak out, but we also want to congratulate you. We know how difficult it is to win any CIF championship, and we are just so proud of you. I know I personally have spent many hours of my life on a tennis court picking up balls, and I know what tenacity and really hard work it takes to get to the level you have. So congratulations to all of you. Okay, so uh, now we're ready for the PTA report. Good evening, President Snell, board members, Dr. Navarro, and cabinet. Well, we're back at school again, and we had our first meeting of 2018 for our Harbor Council. We had Vanessa Gailey come and present to us LCAP which is always a thrill because she explains it so easily and so simply that uh, our parents are very grateful that they can understand it um, only because of the way she's presented it. So it was really uh, helpful to us. We are trying to do uh, several mini promotions in the coming months just for PTA awareness and making parents feel comfortable in coming to us and being part of it. Uh, our first one right now going on is called Cup of Joe, and we're encouraging the schools, the elementary schools especially, to try and have just uh, 
you know, at a certain time, if it's once every two weeks or once a month, whatever works time-wise for parents to be able to drop their kids off and then just come over and grab a cup of coffee with us um, just outside, just easy to do, and then go about their day. But it's just another way of introducing them to PTA. Uh, we have Killybrook, which is now, they are now doing it um, before, during, and after flag deck, every time they have flag deck, just to encourage PTA participation. Our PTAs are currently working on their slates for their officers for next year, which is taking their attention right a, a lot right now. Um, I had the opportunity this last week to hear Diana McDonald, who is the new California State PTA president. She was here in town and I had an opportunity to hear her speak. And it was most interesting um, to find out that PTA has been working statewide very diligently on coming up with electronic memberships. And it's been kind of a hitch in the road for us because so many of our schools still use envelopes mm -hmm. and checks and that's really getting out of date. Um, and I think sometimes that's hindrance, a hindrance to the schools to be able to draw people in because it's like, oh, I gotta write a check and put it in the envelope, get it to school, et cetera. So we're really happy to hear that statewide, they hope very soon to have electronic memberships where you can just sign up and use PayPal or they also have some other services. And I think that um, it's gonna help our PTAs because we do have some of our larger PTAs currently that have their own websites and they do use PayPal for memberships, but the great majority of them don't. And so that's going to further our challenge on getting our PTAs into having their own websites in order to do that and use the state uh, membership program. So we're seeking some guidance from state on, on getting people trained and getting our websites set up, et cetera. So that's how busy we've been so far. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, community input. Uh, no. no. I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. I just I just well, checked you right off. Uh, oh, <laughs> Do you want? Would you like to start, Rachel? Yes. Okay. Good evening, board and distinguished guests. I'm Rachel Krikorian on behalf of Costa Mesa High School. I'll be giving a brief update of things that have been going on at our campus. Our, the high school and middle school are excited to bring back student of the quarter. As part of our PBIS incentive, teachers were asked to select one student last quarter based on the letter M from the Mesa Way. The letter M stands for model integrity. Um, in sports updates, Diane Molina was named the Daily Pilot Athlete of the Year. Diane is a cross-country runner who finished fifth in the state this year. Um, other things going on, both of our principals have been very excited about their monthly walk and talk series. This is a time for potential, for potential or current families to walk our campus, ask questions, and hear all of the great things happening at both Costa Mesa Middle and High School. Thank you. Great, thank you. I like that. It was <laughs> Good evening, President Snell, board trustees, Dr. Navarro, members of the cabinet, and distinguished guests. Um, I am Alexandra Leon from Early College High School. We just came back from winter break today, so today's our first day starting our second semester with our high school courses. We also want to recognize our senior class. As you may know, November 30th was the deadline for many four-year colleges and universities. Among the 54 seniors in our class, a total of 183 four-year college and university applications were submitted, which means about an average of three applications per student. So we're looking forward for the upcoming months to see what opportunities come our way with higher education. Last month, before we went on our winter break, we held our winter soccer match featuring our current high school students and our ECHS alumni. And the match ended in a 3-3 draw. Mm. And we planned to have a rematch in May, and it was a really fun night. It was very, very cold at Jim Scott. <laughs> And also before break, we had our first semester final exams. Uh, during the week, our ASB actually made <coughs> posters to encourage our students. So we made over 250 posters. <coughs> and we made a poster for every student on our campus. So our ASB was actually at school Monday at 6 AM putting up posters. Oh, wow. So it was very exciting to see the students walk around and look for their names and see the message that they got for finals week. On the 29th marks our start for our second semester with Coastline Community College courses that will be held on our campus. 
We have 16 different college courses taught by uh, 13 different professors. And next Wednesday, which is the 24th of January, we have our monthly local restaurant fundraiser, which is Panda Express on Harvard Boulevard from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. As long as you mention ECHS, you will receive 20% back. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Good evening, uh, board and distinguished guests uh, and the cabinet. Um, Max Johnson from Corona de Mar High School um, to give him the student board report. So we've, um, we have our finals fiesta coming up on Sunday, January 28th from 5 to 7. And that's um, encouraging. We try to encourage as many of our staff members to come and just they hold, um, hold even if it's only for an hour, to help have, allow students to ask questions right before finals. I've gone every year so far, and it's really helpful. And ASB also provides food for everyone, so <laughs> it's fun. And then um, also youth and government just got back this weekend from our trip, which is um, this on, uh, on, sorry, on Monday it was from, we were in Fresno, and then in February, we, February we go to Sacramento, so that will be really fun and exciting to go to. And we also had our packed a gym night last Friday night where we had our first home basketball game for both boys and girls. And we had an amazing turnout. We're just trying to just increase our school spirit, which is going really well this year so far. And we also have help from Mr. McCaffrey, a new teacher at our school from uni. And so he's really helping a lot and helping our ASB increase spirit. And this Saturday, we have girls battle of the Bay game. <laughs> and so that's going to be a great game. So we're all excited and getting ready, trying to build, uh, make some posters mm -hmm. and build spirit for that game. And then finally, we had theater tryouts, which just finished this last week. And all of our theater programs are getting ready for some big performances this year. So we're getting, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Good, good evening, board. I'm Andrea from Estancia, sorry. <laughs> and Happy New Year's. So I want to start off that not much is going on right now. We are. Or starting today, we started selling our formal ticket, which will be at the Avenue of Arts Hotel in Costa Mesa. And we're just getting ready for finals week as well. Our ASB, we've been, post, we've been doing a lot of posters that motivate our students, Spanish and also in English. Um, our link crew is helping the little freshmen like, get, ready for, get, ready, get ready to study in like, different ways instead of them like, stressing out. And that's pretty much it. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Melanie Nunez and I'm representing Back Bay High School. Um, so for academic updates, our seniors have um, applied and submitted their college applications to OCC today in our NPR um, with OCC's admission staff. Now for athletic updates, um, our staff beat the students in our flag football um, Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. um, our most recent um, updates would be, our most recent events would be on December 12th, every Back Bay and a few Monte Vista students um, took the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Test. Mm -hmm. Um, we are excited to use the results as we explore and discuss careers in our advisory um, classes. Um, now for some general information. Advisory will now meet um, twice a month for 47 minutes. Our PBIS team will be re revamping our advisory classes so we can be with one teacher advisor and one peer um, group for our entire Back Bay career. The PBIS team hopes that our new advi advisory time would help bolster culture and forge quality relationships. Thank you. And everybody? Okay. Yeah, every high school. Every high school. Good for you. We love it when everybody, all the high schools come. <laughs> okay. Now, now. <coughs> we're now going read. to um, community input. So now I read. This is an opportunity for the public <laughs> to address the board on consent calendar agenda. I can't, I said, blah, blah, it's been a while since I had to read it. Consent calendar agenda items or non-agenda matters within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Each speaker has three <coughs> minutes, and speakers may not cede unused minutes to other speakers. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. In compliance with board policy and the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not permitted to take action on non-agenda items. When addressing the board, it is helpful if you state your name and address for the record. 
Okay, first uh, speaker is Dr. Rick Kinney. Hi, board. Uh, I'm uh, the one that's been writing you the last couple of months uh, regards to Davidson Field. Uh, I live in Newport Heights, and we've We've got this beautiful track and field, and uh, we can't use it, and <coughs> it's locked. And I, I know that the uh, board wants to protect the synthetic surfaces and feels that we don't have anything in place that might be sufficient to protect a synthetic track from dogs and the apartment neighbors. Uh, I wrote the mayor. Mayor Duffy graciously met with me, and we talked about the situation, and he, he said, he asked, what about cameras? And I re relayed that to you. And the response that I got was, well, they're not good enough, maybe not enough. And so I met with a security firm. And the security firm relayed to me that the analytics and cameras are so good today that they can identify when a dog comes into the field of surveillance <coughs> and immediately ping a department like our own police department. And on top of that, they have a voice capabilities, so the moment a dog would arrive on the track, the voice would say, by the way, dogs are not allowed here. So, uh, my sense is that the city really wants the track to be open, and I, I know that you, you want to protect your investment, and my sense was that if there was this capability and we used it as a trial balloon for this same problem that's coming to Corona Del Mar High shortly, that it might be a, a nice test balloon for does would this work? And I think the city probably would even agree to make things right if a dog did get on the track and create a problem there. So I, I'm here today just to hope that we communicate about this. And uh, I would love to be able to run on the track and walk with my wife on the track and watch my neighbors uh, climb stairs and uh, use this great resource. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your input. I think input. I could help a little bit. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kinney, you can take a seat. I just want to let you know that um, we have uh, uh, reached out to the city. Uh, we do need uh, someone there to uh, be uh, uh, to observe it. It's a, it's a community recreation time, and that uh, really uh, falls in the domain of the city. So we don't mind working with the city. We just have to come to some kind of an agreement and uh, see what times are available. Um, the track uh, will not be available when our students are on it, so we have to find times that they, it can be used. So just to let you know, we are in conversations with the city. But I can't tell you how quickly that's going to go. There are a lot of avenues we all have to explore. Okay, next speaker, Susan McPhail. Good evening. <clears throat> Bullying in schools is a big deal. Millions of dollars is spent to protect students from discrimination based on nationality, religion, sex, size, ethnicity, and sexual orientation. Yet, we do nothing to protect students from being bullied because of their political beliefs. Every one of you would be horrified if I said that men are sexual molesters, Muslims are terrorists, or homosexuals are mentally ill. Generalizing about groups of people is inaccurate and inflammatory, but it was perfectly fine for my daughter's teacher to tell her class, Republicans are selfish. A number of times this year, Zora's teacher said something insulting about President Trump, and afterwards, students raised their hands and shared their own insults. Was it a discussion about policy? No. It was nothing more than name-calling. When a school district says it has no tolerance for bullying, then bullying of any kind should not be permitted. Teachers who defame a political figure they dislike are giving students the okay to do the same to anyone who disagrees with them. A few months ago, a boy approached our daughter in a classroom and shouted, Zora, stop being a racist. This young man decided she is a racist because Zora doesn't share his opinion on immigration issues. There you have it. Generalizing, intimidation, insults, and bullying all rolled into one sentence. Now, where do you suppose he learned that? 
What do you suppose other students will say and do to this young woman and others like her? We're creating an environment in schools where students are shamed into hiding their opinions or sacrificing their self-respect to avoid being bullied. These are three examples of what's taken place in our daughter's classroom. In the past year and a half, we've met with Estancia High School administrators two other times to discuss similar incidents with two other teachers. There's a pattern here that goes beyond Estancia High School. Education should teach our children how to think for themselves. Our schools stop being a place of learning when teachers are permitted to tell students what to think. Sadly, it's perfectly legal for teachers to misuse their classrooms, indoctrinating students to support the office holders, candidates, and policies that they prefer. We learned from Zora's principle that school administrators can do nothing to ensure that students are not bullied by their teachers or fellow students for having an opinion that is not aligned with that of a teacher or a classmate. Only school districts and the state of California can determine what can and cannot go on in a classroom. It's time for the NMUSD to step up to protect the political beliefs of students. You and the state of California are the only ones who can. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker is, oh. Uh, Mr. Lee Sung, uh, will okay. you, we have her information. Will you contact Ms. McPhail? Okay. Uh, Steve Smith. <clears throat> Thank you, Mrs. Snell. Good evening, everyone. I want to help you understand something very important about the closing of the Estancia pool. The sequence of events that led to this costly mistake are not the problem. They're merely a symptom. The problem is that you are consistently, consistently not receiving the information that you need to make the most timely and informed decisions. The problem is chronic. I'll give you some examples by asking you three rhetorical questions. Knowing what you know now, would you have voted to close the pool? Knowing what you know now, would you have voted to erect the poles around the baseball diamond there? Knowing what you know now, would you have voted to wait years before you got rid of Swan Math? In each of these cases, information was either missing or grossly inaccurate. And in each of these cases and more, it was the community that brought them to your attention, not your administration. There's a pattern here, and where there's a pattern, there's a problem. The problem is a breakdown in the leadership of, this admin of the administration in this district. A well-managed organization of any type, public or private, is proactive and takes steps to avoid errors that could affect the budget or the mission. You do not have that proactive leadership in your administration. For example, the district should have been in compliance with the CVRA years ago. Instead, it took a lawsuit to affect change. There are now no archived meetings of the vid videos of the meetings because the district failed to comply with, a with an old ADA regulation. There was no intention of dumping Swan Math until the hue and cry became so great that the administration had no choice. There was no investigation into the Mariner's Gold Ribbon application until the union brought up <coughs> accusations of untruths and inaccuracies, which leads me to my final observation. Another component of this problem is the failure of anyone in this administration to take ownership of serious mistakes. In the case of the Gold Ribbon scandal, I want to point out that Laura Sachs is no longer employed by the district but the superintendent who approved the gold ribbon application has just received a rating of exceptional and also got a bonus. This is the type of disconnect that dis is dismaying a growing group of people in the community. Throwing $100,000 at the Estancia pool and allowing the fox to run the investigation of the hen house is not helping matters. It's only going to make them worse. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next speaker, Britt Doughty. Good evening, President Snell, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, members of the public. I'm Britt Doughty. I am the president of the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers. Uh, and I just wanted to give you a couple of bits of news about what's going on with NMFT. 
Uh, first, uh, we are beginning a member outreach. Uh, we spoke to this earlier in the school year that we were going to start doing some customer service outreach to our members and make sure that we're doing a good job for them. Uh, and we're kicking off that process at all of our school sites over the next month and a half. And we're just wanting to build those individual connections with members and uh, with their elected leaders and see how we're doing. Um, and also, it's a little bit of a membership outreach drive just for helping to grow membership as well. Uh, also, we want to acknowledge yesterday uh, the celebration for Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, as we all know, he was a civil rights leader, and uh, he uh, gave support for the most disenfranchised people out there. And this is something that we know that teachers do on a daily basis as well, is to try to help those kids that need the help, as, especially within Newport Mesa. And also, many people may not remember, but Dr. King was also a fierce advocate for, uh, for workers and workers' rights and for, for employee unions. And, uh, and we want to thank his, uh, his leadership uh, for helping the working people throughout the United States as well. Um, also, tomorrow we will be visiting our top teachers of the year in, the, in five elementary classrooms and five secondary classrooms. Uh, we will be doing classroom visitations and then interviewing those 10 teachers. Uh, and to recognize who the top teachers of the year are for the district. And this time around, we're going to hold that as a bit of surprise and make the final announcement during the uh, celebration dinner, which is hosted by the Newport Mesa Schools Foundation. Uh, so that is the, the dinner where uh, the grant recipients are recognized, as well as the teachers of the year from each school site. So we'll hold on to that final announcement until then. And maybe that will help spur some ticket sales. So if you <laughs> need to reach out to support the foundation, either by being a donor or by purchasing a grant, I mean, uh, by purchasing a ticket for the dinner, uh, the website is Newport Schools, with a plural S, foundation. Um, and you can look it up and log in that way or contact some of us and we'll put you in touch with board members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant idea. <laughs> Uh, next speaker is Marty O'Mara. Good evening, Dr. Navarro, President Snell, and trustees. I am not happy with your decision uh, to delete the school board videos. This creates a hardship for parents and taxpayers to learn what is going on and how their money is being spent and what votes were taken. For example, I could not <coughs> attend last week's meeting on Thursday morning regarding the Estancia pool. When I asked for the video, I was told I could order the video for a dollar and go to the district to pick it up. They could not send the video via email or internet. Convenient? No. For one little question I wanted an answer to, you want me to go to the district and pick up the CD. I do not have a CD drive anymore at my house. The library doesn't have them either, so I don't know where I'm supposed to even watch these. I have researched school districts submitting uh, subtitling school board meetings. I uh, earlier today watched the USLA USD. They do not have subtitles in their meetings, nor do they have any of the old meetings subtitled. I talked to Orange County Department of Ed. They could not give me much information on rulings for school board meetings. Your email that you sent to me says that the broadcasters, cable countries, companies, and satellite TV service providers must provide closed captioning for 100% of all new, not exempt, English language video programming to meet the American Disabilities Act. I have discussed this with several cities. All have said that the school districts are exempt. Newport Beach does not subtitle their city council meetings. The head of the TV person there told me that the FDA mandate, effective January 18th, to have subtitles was a federal mandate, not a state or city mandate. The rule does not apply to city or school districts. They're looking into subtitling for the future because they think it's going to happen sometime down the line. Costa Mesa does not subtitle their city meetings because it is not a law for nonprofit groups of which cities and school districts would fall under. Huntington Beach, Fountain Valley, Stanton, Westminster, TV stations that broadcast city and school events do not subtitle school districts because they are a nonprofit organization. Newport Mesa School District falls under the same guidelines. We are not special. Um, I'd like uh, to ask Ms. Uh, Franco to come up and just 
give you some uh, research background that she's conducted on ADA compliance requirements. Hi, good evening, President Snell, members of the board, Dr. Navarro and cabinet. Um, in our research, we started about a year and a half ago making sure that all of our district websites were ADA compliant. And one of those pieces was videos. So it is our understanding that videos had to include closed captioning. For example, if you look at the video that we currently have on our district homepage, um, it does include closed captioning. Our State of the Schools video from September also does include closed captioning. However, our board videos, and I am not connected with the board videos themselves. I am only responsible for what's on the website. But my understanding is that it would uh, be very costly to get those to be uh, transcribed. I believe we were in conversations with attorneys to figure out if we were exempt from that or not. Um, don't know what if we received response yet on that or anything, but we're holding <laughs> off on that. One thing I can tell you, I think it was about a year and a half or two years ago, the University of Berkeley did something amazing, and they actually had thousands and thousands of videos, I think it was 20,000 videos on their website, of teacher lectures that were completely free for the community. Um, and they actually just ripped those down because of ADA compliance as well. So they also said it was too costly to convert those and have them um, be transcribed. Uh, so University of Berkeley received a little bit of pushback two years, a lot of bit of pushback two years ago because they had an amazing free service to their community and they had to bring those down. So it's something that we're working on with the superintendent's office to determine what to do with the videos. Uh, maybe a little too early, but I do believe that our agenda hosting service uh, is expected to have video hosting capabilities and in that case we'd be able to put our videos on their server and um, not have to worry about it. And our understanding is that school districts do have to comply with it because we do receive federal funds. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So huh. we'll get more information as it becomes available. Okay, next speaker, Ashley Anderson. Hello, good evening everyone. Good evening. <laughs> um, I was happy to see several items on the agenda that address IT. Um, I got my master's in digital teaching and learning and I'm really excited that we're really taking some next steps. Um, and even with the mention of the adoption of Chromebooks as the standard instructional in, um, technology device and the implementation of one-to-one -one Chromebook initiative, um, that is awesome, and I would love to just continue the conversation about Wi-Fi capacity for some of our students. Um, I've spoken to a student um, at Whittier who is in sixth grade who was not allowed to take home her Chromebook, so she wasn't able to do her test. She wasn't able to do her homework. It was just assumed, possibly, that she had Wi-Fi at home. Um, and after looking at her report card, she had ones and twos, and she's extremely intelligent. And I learned it was because she did not have access at home. She has five brothers and sisters, and both of her parents worked two jobs. Um, and so I think that the district could maybe do a better job with making sure that um, students have that capacity. Their UCLA is, their campus is probably the size of Costa Mesa. If we had a system in place, I have two ideas. If we had a system in place where students throughout Costa Mesa and Newport Beach could use their login, it's not like it's a free Wi-Fi, but could use their login so they could access the internet at home, that would be huge. Or if each school was able to expand their Wi-Fi boundaries, because a lot of the students that walk to school live within close proximity, that would be huge. Um, I've spoken to a few principals that literally have kids in the parking lots on Sunday nights taking their accelerated reader tests that live a block across the street from the school. All of those could be remedied and the children and the academic success could actually be met at the level that the children are capable of with some, uh, some huge tweaks to the Wi-Fi capabilities that are currently in place. Um, this is something that is huge. It's already January, so we already have kids that did their fall quarter um, and they did not have that ability. So I would love to see that being addressed um, immediately if possible because we don't want another school year to go by. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good comments. And I agree with you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So superintendent report. 
Yeah, I have two uh, issues I'd like to discuss <coughs> okay. or share. Um, first of all, that was an amazing team, undefeated uh, mm -hmm. and, and CIF champion. And there was a lot of work. I, Mrs. Yelsey mentioned how she was picking up t tennis balls. I'm sure that was, was, for, was for one of your daughters' <laughs> <laughs> teams. Uh, so there's a parent support that's incredible behind the scenes. Uh, the coach, of course, is, 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 is key to creating an, a climate where students really want to excel and love the game. Uh, and, you, and, you know, you see coaches who uh, make a difference in the same group of kids and they become better players. Um, but what's behind the scenes is don't, people don't realize that uh, this board invests in all of that. Uh, and over this last year, you will have invested over $2 million in supporting all the athletics in this district. And that includes the transportation, that includes the equipment, that includes uh, helping schools with uh, paying for officials. Uh, each ASB gets an allotment just for athletics. Uh, you certify certain safety equipment, helmets, shoulder pads, for example, uh, at each school. And uh, people don't realize how much happens behind the scenes, but it's a $2 million investment every year. Uh, to support our teams and could we use a lot more absolutely mm -hmm. but uh, I doubt if there are many other districts that reach that level for the size that we are uh, so I think uh, yeah, it's great to celebrate these but I want everybody to know that you support every athlete in this district whether they're a CIF champion or just learning the game mm -hmm. and it's uh, very important to this board about that about uh, educating the whole child uh, the other thing is uh, I, I appreciate Miss Anderson coming up here and talking about <coughs> wireless as you know that's an issue near and dear to my heart um, and we are experimenting and uh, and researching the most efficient an effective manner to provide Wi-Fi to our students at no cost. And uh, right now we are exploring whether we can use uh, our FCC licensed radio waves to provide that. There is a system out there, it's in, it's in the baby stage, okay? Uh, but uh, it is possible to provide free Wi-Fi using our FCC radio waves. We've talked with the city and the other uh, community districts about sharing those waves with us that they have so that we could provide it. Um, uh, putting out Wi-Fi units is another option, but that's a lot of units to put out. Uh, this radio frequency would be powerful enough to uh, reach all of our kids with a lot uh, with the, with the, an investment that is more concentrated on the equipment. However, like I said, it's in its infancy. So we are exploring. There's one, according to uh, uh, Mr. Bobovich, your IT director, there's really only one place that serves 600 homes with this technology right now because it's so new. But it's a promising technology and something we're really looking hard at. Um, and then other options, you know, uh, whether you provide uh, those uh, clip-in Internet data uh, uh, inserts, that might be an option uh, for some of our students who mm -hmm. are, are, aren't able to uh, achieve Wi-Fi. But we're looking for the most a long range solution that we're gonna be able to sustain over years that will be uh, as current as possible with new technology. Oh, I didn't. There I did. Um, simultaneously to looking for that really good long range quality program, are there any Maybe not as wonderful, but some quick fixes, some <coughs> some band-aid programs, if you will, to help our kids now because, and I know that you've been working on this for a while. When Once we said we wanted to go Chromebooks and get one-to-one, -one, we knew that we had to help a lot, a lot of our pop kids to mm -hmm. get access to Wi-Fi. I just was wondering, are we, Doing both. So one of the things we want to try to avoid, especially with net neutrality, is to go through any service providers because they be might expensive. slow down our, our, our oh. system. And so the best solution for us is to provide direct connection to our system to our students. Okay. That way they're protected by our filter mm. and our speed that won't be slowed down. Um, that takes a little bit of different technology yes. than to put out just Wi-Fi units uh, and bounce them off of his relay stations. Uh, we would have to, I mean, my understanding is that would take some coordination with some service providers and we don't really want to do that. 
Uh, that's, the that's the drawback mm -hmm. with the little Wi-Fi inserts is their service providers, and they will determine who gets fast speed and who doesn't get fast speed now with the new, well, with now without any rules <laughs> right. Right. for the Internet. And so uh, that, those are some of the subtleties that our staff, our experts, are taking into consideration as they come to, they'll be coming to us with a recommendation, uh, uh, but we have to research it thoroughly mm -hmm. uh, before we come to you. Uh, and uh, and I, I have trust in our IT department that they're going to be able to come to us with a really sound recommendation. I mean, there are things we can do. We can uh, drive our buses and park them out in neighborhoods. Uh, but, you know, uh, the school districts that have done that, some have had some vandalism, not a lot, but still something to consider. Uh, but we really want the mo ro most robust, secure system we can have out there. That's the most important thing, A, to get students the service they need, and B, to protect students through our filters. Thank you. Okay. Just on to add to that, oh, when sorry. do you think this new technology will be available? You know, I think that's something I'm going to have to ask Mr. Holcomb to, uh, or Mr. Marsh to have uh, Mr. Bovich come in and share with you. Oh, good. Because he's the expert. I, I am merely a consumer of his, of his information. Okay. And uh, it would be best for him to come and talk to us. And perhaps by then he'll, he may be honing uh, the direction that we, he thinks we should go as far as providing internet service to our students. Okay. Is, is that it? Yeah, I'm done with my report. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, consent calendar. Nope. Okay. I don't think. Those, there's no cards. No, they would have been. Yeah. Yeah. Move adoption of the consent <coughs> calendar. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, moving on to the discussion action calendar. Okay. Pardon? Okay, okay, great. Um, we do have a card on this. Yes. Oh, we have a card on this one. Oh, well, then I better. Read. Okay. Oh, okay. Discussion yes. Action. Um, we have a speaker, Ron Rabino, president of East Bluff Homeowners Association. Good evening. Good evening. President Snell, trustees, uh, Dr. Navarro, district staff, and the guests today. I'm Ron Rubino, as you said, president of the East Bluff Homeowners Association, a resident of Newport Beach for 30 years. I'm here tonight to express our HOA support for the proposed revisions to your board policy 1330A, as recommended by the superintendent. We have earlier today emailed a letter of support, and I have provided copies to Sherry Snyder and a copy for each of the trustees and Dr. Navarro. We believe the proposed revisions to your board policy 1330 demonstrate the Board of Education's commitment to the CEQA process and the final EIR recently approved for the Corona Del Mar sports fields, which are across from our homes. We look forward to participating in the working group established by district administration for ongoing communications with our HOA. We also want to express appreciation to Dr. Navarro for his leadership and desire to work in a cooperative manner with our association to address how the operating parameters, mitigation measures, and future communications will be implemented. Thank you for the opportunity to express our support for the revisions for Board Policy 1330A. Thank you very Thank you. much. I'm going to go to the podium because I've got okay. 1330A up on the now we're going to look at 13. Excuse me? I don't know whose phone is tilting me. Okay, well, first of all, I see part of our working group out here, and I want to thank them for the last couple of years of meeting with us and spending a lot of time willing to have those hard discussions and willing to have some laughs at the same time. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it really made it constructive for us. Uh, and I also like to thank Mr. Rubino for his leadership and being uh, willing to come up and, and work with us. He uh, took time out of his busy day to come up and meet with Mr. Holcomb and I a couple times uh, over the break, and that was, that was a, a fruitful uh, uh, meeting because we were able to come up with some uh, points that we could agree to move forward. And, and I do want everybody uh, in the community to know that the direction of this board is to be a good neighbor. 
And you've said that for years. Mm -hmm. You've asked us to make sure that uh, we work with our neighbors. And you'll see that we've added that to this uh, board policy. So there's no more uh, uh, question about what the intent is of that. So on this board policy, uh, there are some minor edits. For example, we don't use governing board anymore. We use board of education, and that's a minor thing. Uh, but the red, in the red is uh, what, we, uh, uh, what we've uh, put in as uh, recommended changes, okay? And basically, uh, and this goes beyond CDM, this is for all our, our facilities. Um, Dr. Kinney was right, you have made a multi-million dollar investment in these. Uh, they're great facilities. The problem is your students are on them all the time <laughs> now. And uh, that leaves very little time for other, other uses. Uh, so uh, this uh, basically uh, 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 focuses that we will be uh, ful fulfilling and uh, meeting the requirements of the EIR and CEQA process for all of our projects that required them. And in some instances, you don't have a lot for example, at Costa Mesa, because it's across the street from the fairgrounds, that was, what, Mr. Marsh, was that uh, a negative? A negative declaration, which means it's really not gonna affect anything, okay? And in the case of Davidson, was that a mitigated or a negative? It was a mitigated declaration mm -hmm. because you were just putting back what was there, okay? Whereas the CDM was very different, it was very different. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we have uh, in here, uh, we've added uh, with uh, a conversation with, uh, with uh, Mr. Rubino about having uh, a consistent way to communicate with the district. So there's two ways to communicate uh, about athletic field facility concerns. We have an email, facilityconcerns <coughs> at nmusd.us, and we have a phone number, 714-424-3696, which will be a 24-hour cycle. Uh, phone number. One of the problems with these, and, and I know Dr. Kinney mentioned the cameras, which is a great idea, but we do have to pay somebody to be on the clock 24 hours a day. And so we have to figure out who that's going to be and how we're going to uh, fund that. Uh, because this person will have to answer that phone call or <laughs> respond to it at some point. Um, following that, um, we, have, we talk about impact. Impact is what the EIR is about. And Mr. Holcomb, keep me uh, honest here and on target. I don't want to misinterpret anything. <laughs> uh, and really what that talks about is we, mess, we assessed, for example, uh, Costa Mesa at 1,000, uh, uh, Newport Harbor at 4,900, CDM at 664, okay? And so the mitigation was measured scientifically against that impact. What would that impact have on everything, noise, parking, uh, crowd, whatever. And so when you do that, that means you have to stick to those capacity numbers. So what we've said here is we will not exceed those capacity numbers for any activity. Um, and rather than just pick one activity that we think might be big, it's really for any time we have spectators. We cannot exceed those, that capacity because the uh, uh, EIR and SUCA have outlined that that's the max and that's the uh, impact that we measure everything at. And to go above that would throw all the science out. So we're going to stick to our capacity. Um, there is one asterisk, and that is that for Costa Mesa and Estancia, we do play the Battle of the Bell at those two schools. So we actually do have to import temporary seating for that one game at both of those schools. So we go back and forth, but we do bring in temporary bleachers for that one game. And that's, that's I wanted to make sure everybody knew that uh, though that was in there and that we do allow it for the Battle of the Bell. Uh, public address systems, you can see what kind we have. Uh, we have three permanents and one portable. CDM does not have a permanent uh, 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 public address system. Uh, regardless though, it's uh, 55 decibels uh, at the edge of the residential property. Okay, so that's, that's the, what the science says. That's what the max we can go, so we'll have to make sure our levels are at the, at, uh, uh, keep within those parameters. Um, lighting, um, so they're all shielded, okay, because shielded keeps the light from going all over the place, directs it uh, right on the field, um, and it's almost like a dark curtain that surrounds the field uh, if it's done properly. Uh, the ones that we've already installed are metal halide, 
However, the board did ask us to explore LED on the, on the, on the CDM field. So we are keeping that option there, okay, as uh, what the lights will be. Um, and the, the candle foot limits uh, are 0.8 at CDM. And the others are not uh, applicable because they have negative or mitigated declarations, okay. all right? Um, and then uh, we talked about when do we measure this? Well, we want to measure this before school year starts. So uh, we put in here that we're going to come out uh, in August and uh, assess all of this, okay? And then come in and have the, uh, the, the neighbors come in and talk with us and say, okay, this is what the measures are, so on and so on. And our, our, our goal here is that this is the first conversation of two that we'll schedule. Uh, in, as, I, as I imagine, as the years go by and we work out more and more issues, we probably won't, may not need two. So we'll offer two a year, but the residents may say, we, we, we'll, just, we'll just have one this year, mm -hmm. okay? And, and so uh, we will provide you with a report of those uh, measures as well as the meetings, okay, in which, which direction we're going. Uh, and so <coughs> use of athletic facilities, um, and these facilities are specifically designed for school instructional programs, ASB activities, or athletic programs. And, in, uh, and, and these are more or less under the Civic Center Act. So you'll see a reference there to use of facilities under the Civic Center Act, which is in our administrative regs of the same number, okay? And then they, you have the schedule. Now the schedule was made last February, I believe. Uh, and, uh, Dr. Bauermeister and Mr. Marsh spent most of the time working on this uh, because you wanted to be clear about what your intent was for lights on our, on our campuses for st during, uh, during certain times. Now, I do want to point out that this is for artificial turf field and tracks. Uh, I do want to point out that school is not in session and we really don't want use when we're not in session. But as I explained to the board earlier and I shared with uh, Mr. Rubino, s districts have breaks at different times. So spring break, you know, for us is sometime in April. It could be uh, late March for another district, could be late April. I don't know when it could be. But we always end up playing games because we're in leagues that are in, in and, we, and, and we're governed by CIF, and they actually the governing body for, for our athletics. So we have to have an asterisk that says that unless CIF is going to schedule a game, <laughs> we're going to have to use it, and otherwise we won't use it. So that's kind of what we have there. Uh, on, 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 on the use of uh, lights and field on artificial track and, and surfaces. Uh, natural turf fields, uh, really, uh, we don't uh, want any use uh, uh, at, at, uh, on, on the, we want to minimize use, but in Costa Mesa, mm -hmm. we have a lot of use with our youth sports. Mm -hmm. So we do work with the city to use some of those natural turf fields for AYSO and then eventually they will have tournaments that are, that are much longer. So we, we uh, have a cutout for that. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something we don't have as much demand on the Newport Beach side. Newport Beach has many, many, many of their own fields, so their demand doesn't affect us. But in Costa Mesa, we really do have to work with our community there. Um, and use of pools. Um, this is something we still need to work on. Um, the board had talked about uh, uh, turning off our lights at eight o'clock at our pools, and that was still under review when I when when I checked with our our uh, our uh, our maintenance and operations department. But we will be coming back to you with a recommendation on that. Um, also, I want to let you. I want to acknowledge uh, the city of Newport Beach, who has uh, graciously agreed to work with us and to split the cost of uh, redesigning the lights at the CDM mm -hmm. pool okay. and uh, bringing uh, in shielded lights. They have to be completely <laughs> redesigned, uh, but uh, they're willing to, to be a partner with us in that, and uh, we really appreciate that they did that voluntarily once they heard that was something the neighbors would really like. So uh, that's uh, ongoing discussion and partnership, and we'll give you more uh, updates as we go around. Uh, this is the part that we added. Uh, that was the intent of the board. I'm sorry, I have a quick finger. Okay, and that's uh, site renovation improvement or alterations. This talks about sharing it with you first, okay, rather than sharing it with anybody. 
and then going out to the community and say, this is what we shared with the board, and talk about uh, impacts and ideas and needs and so on, and then come back and do what an accordion process. You know, we do that quite a bit in instruction. I know the Ed Division is really good about consensus building mm -hmm. and going back and forth. Uh, but that's really the, the format that we're trying to implement now. Uh, you know, Mr. Holcomb has brought that to your attention mm -hmm. as he's brought to you uh, some ideas that we have on designs or projects that we might look at. Uh, but this pretty much puts it in writing that uh, we'll engage local community members on projects, uh, we'll share the information, we'll uh, get input, we'll share that result of that input with the board and come back so that we can make decisions based on uh, not only the science, but also the input of our neighbors. Science is important, uh, but so is getting uh, information from those who are affected. Okay, and pretty much that's it, because then the rest goes into our legal citations, and oh, I guess we uh, adopted this one in August, not in February, but that's when we changed all the light times. So, okay. any questions? Yes. Um, first, I, I want to thank the um, the editing uh, group. Uh, three three people um, edited these before, so we wouldn't be here for hours. Uh, I think it took three hours, right? Okay. Um, you did a great job. I couldn't hardly find anything. <laughs> I did find well, one found thing. Something. I found something. But I'm going to let Miss Matoye go first. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And because we have a, the similar yes, eye, we found similar, the same things. Yeah. Um, on page A. A, I need to get to A. Um, and Sherry will be taking notes mm -hmm. so that we don't have to rely on my, my very good memory that's short. <laughs> there it was. Okay. Under the heading of athletic facilities, uh -huh. the, um, the sentence reads, concerns about school operations pertaining to student activities or athletics on or in district the word outdoor should be scratched because okay. while we were discussing it in editing, we added the gyms, and so therefore it's not just outdoors. So that was just a. Right. Mm -hmm. And while we did spend three hours, it was once everything got all cleaned up, then it was like, oh, how did we miss that? Also on page B, um, a parenthesis in the um, first chart under main field, there's a parenthesis that shows up after the 200 and it should be before 200. So it's 664 for the main field and then 200 for the auxiliary field. Okay, all right. Okay, yes, I'm, is that it? You got and, one more? Yes, and I wanted, I wanted to thank it. Part, um, Mrs. Yelsey and Mrs. Floor and I worked really hard to, to make this something that's global and make sure it's for the whole entire district. And that's why so many things specify athletics because since this is use of school facilities, we figured that at one point we're gonna come back and have to tackle theaters and, then, yeah. and other wonderful good, great things that, that we share with the community, so. Great, theaters are great, but your schools can. <laughs> are you yeah. kidding? Are you Our elementary <laughs> schools would, would have that theater so packed they all do. the time. They do, they already do. But we still need to make sure that yep. it's clear to everyone why yeah. It isn't this open building most of the time. Yeah. It's a big classroom. Okay. Are those your edits? Those are my edits, yes. Okay. I just have one, um, and uh, that's on the very last page. Uh, there is uh, a double oh, um, asterisk. Asterisk. Leading to the and, But you took, you took that out, so you just need to take the asterisk out. Oh, under Sunday? Yeah. Okay. And then the other issue I had was explained to me earlier, so... There you go. Okay. So good job. All right. Yeah. So we recommend that you adopt this tonight, and we'll make the edits as, as outlined tonight. So okay. Do I have a, a move, motion? Move adoption of as board policy as amended. Thirteen thirty as amended tonight. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Oh. Okay. Oh, I turned you off. I can't catch you. No, Mrs. Yelsey just turned on. Oh, did you turn on? Oh, Mrs. Yelsey? No, after we vote. That, that's oh, we, I think we just voted. We did. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, too, just want, I, I have never been involved with a process over a period of years with so many really <laughs> committed, intelligent people who are really concerned about the community. And I know 
several of them are here mm -hmm. um, today. And I really do want to thank you because it's been a very cohesive, mm -hmm. um, we've all put in many hours on this and I really want, I, I, I've learned a lot from you and mm -hmm. I, I appreciate everything you did to make this happen. So thank you for your commitment to all this. That's great. Absolutely. Okay, and, and I want to add to that, that because of that now, we have policy in place to address this every time we do it, no matter what school does it, we will make sure that the community is, we hear all stakeholders, not necessarily community, but stakeholders, the sites, mm -hmm. the, the principal, principal yeah. and we make sure that, and it's in place, that this continues. So, thank you. <coughs> okay, so, so uh, board member reports, starting with Karen. <clears throat> um, sure, I just have a couple of things. Um, when I was at the Corona Del Mar PTA meeting last week and I had the opportunity to go look at the new Learning Resource Center oh, that is that. taking the place of the library and it's going to be pretty amazing. This is a, a um, whole program that was put together by the foundation at the school. They started this in 2012, talking about it, visiting. I know I went back then with Back then, I went with them to Modern Day to look at their center that they had developed, and I know they since have visited some other places, but it's really gonna be very special. And they're in the process now of painting. Um, I think it's gonna open by the end of February. The superintendent of the project was there the day I went, and he was apologizing because it's two weeks late. And I go, two weeks? <laughs> I mean, we've had projects way longer than that. So it's going to be really, really nice when it's open. And I think the students are just going to be blown away by, by what they see. But I want to thank not only the foundation, because they've also solicited money from other groups at the school. I know the PTA has given them over $100,000 for the project. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition to what the foundation has, has brought in, and they've gone out to outside sources also to get some money. So you have to give a lot of, of all the credit to them for, for what they've done, and I know they've worked really well um, with district staff to make this happen. Oh, one other thing. I went to uh, the Corona Del Mar Theater the other uh, last week to see the Harbor Views play of oh, Susical Jr. <laughs> They did, you would not know it was an elementary school. Were you there, did you see it? You would not know it was an elementary school doing this program. They were absolutely fabulous. And I brought their program because I've never seen a program like this. It is a hardbound book <laughs> that they put together and gave to everyone who came in, so I'll pass it That's down. Amazing. Because wow. they did a fabulous job. Wow. So it's one of my favorite kid plays. Wow. Look at and that's it. it. Okay. Your turn. Hmm. Um, I, I'm also very excited because um, it was in under our consent calendar, but I also PTA, we adopted the California State um, Smart Parent Engagement mm -hmm. Program, and uh, my daughter's very much involved in that up north, <laughs> and uh, it, it's an amazing program, so I was really tickled, and, and after your speech a couple meetings ago when you were saying we want to, you know, include the community, they were already working on an opportunity for us to engage. So kudos to us and, you know, for in, uh, adopting this and, um, and partnering with our PTA. It's really a phenomenal program, so. And with that, Happy New Year. <laughs> <laughs> happy New Year, but no report. <laughs> no report. Well, we started the New Year bright <coughs> early. Mrs. Snell and I at the uh, Costa Mesa Youth Sports Committee, Amazing. which yeah, and Mrs. Franco, thank you. Um, it, it is the meeting that is headed by the Costa Mesa United Group, and it is, we, we focus on the sports because we share our fields with Costa Mesa kids that we often talk about all the user groups, all the youth sport leaders, AYSO, all the little leagues, lacrosse, football, we all, and aquatics, we all discuss so that we have, it's a very positive, very forward thinking and, and, and professional group of, of people that get up way too early to have to have a meeting. And <laughs> it, but it results in providing space for all of the kids to be able to enjoy and hone in their sports. Um, 
which culminates for Costa Mesa United in their major fundraiser every year, which I like that it takes place on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, which is supposed to be a day of service. So um, Mrs. Snell and I typically join together and we work for uh, in the morning to welcome all the golfers and welcome all the vendors. And Costa Mesa United has worked diligently for the kids in um, Costa Mesa. And this includes the three major high schools that service Costa Mesa kids, which is Costa Mesa High School, Estancia High School, and Newport Harbor High School. Lest you don't think we are ignoring early college or back bay, those are district-wide high schools. So they're not located, they're, they just happen to be located in the city. Um, and Costa Mesa, at, they had the Mesa Verde Classic yesterday, and at that time it was announced that in December they reached their milestone of donating $1,050,000 to our students over the last 14 years. Wow. Yeah. They have donated to our kids with the prospects of continuing on and donating more. It was, it's a great fun day, and... Uh, if you missed out, next year, Martin Luther King Day, there will be one. Feel free to contact mm -hmm. Costa Mesa United. It was a wonderful day. Mm -hmm. I know they sell out. Every they do sell year, out. So, um, it, on that same, um, uh, talking about Costa Mesa United Youth Sports Meeting, um, one of the things that came up was um, that they now have a master a field schedule. Mm -hmm. on the city website so if you can um, if you need to know who's on who's on first mm -hmm. you can go and find out if they're if somebody's right. you know in a on a field and they don't look like they're real you can go in and see if it's really the person that's supposed to be there but the reason they do that is not for that they do it um, the other people in this meeting are heads of, of all the city organizations, AYSO, Little League, so it's to serve them as well. That's why this meeting is so helpful, because mm -hmm. it helps the, um, the volunteers that for these sports teams work with the city and work with the district <coughs> on, um, on things they need to work on. Um, they were very interested in um, uh, and us continuing uh, the field use policy update, which I know we've had the, um, I mean, I'm sorry, the JUA update that um, we had a study session on it and we really well, haven't done anything else. So um, we probably need, to, move forward need on that. to get an update and figure out, I don't know what's going on with that, but um, yeah, the JUA. They were interested in that. Um, they were also, Costa Mesa United was very interested in um, uh, a project that they um, may help fund, which is the field uh, sprinklers at T. Winkle, um, T. Winkle Middle School. I guess the sprinklers out on the field. Um, irrigation system is not just sprinklers. It's antiquated. Yeah, it's <laughs> antiquated, and so um, that's something that um, I hope we can look into. Um, I also attended um, the city district's liaison meeting, which is a meeting that involves the city, uh, Newport Mesa, the sanitation district, and the water district. And um, we kind of take turns going mm -hmm. to that. So um, very interesting. They they were they went over the city went over the street projects. Um, the project uh, projects on Placentia, mm -hmm. the, and yeah, and oh, Bristol, sure. and Arlington. So supposedly yes. the project uh, in front of Estancia should be done in January. I haven't been by for a couple of weeks, so I don't know the status of it. Um, and the January. one on Arlington should be done in <laughs> May. Wow, that's yeah, amazing. that's I know. Well. It is what it is. It's, it is what it is. But anyway, they talked about that. Uh, Stevens, Councilman Stevens, uh, talked about the pilot mobile restroom project. And I guess they're voting on it tonight, although it could get delayed, who knows. But um, so he encouraged us all to come and speak about it. But here we are. I told him I had another meeting. So. <laughs> and um, 
so that's an interesting group. And uh, so we, that I'm kind of reporting on my meetings. We're just, it sounds like we're doing that all at once. Um, yes. Let me see, what else did I have on here? Oh, no, that's it, okay, I'm done. Happy New Year. Yes. It seems like 100 years ago, but happy New it Year. It was. <laughs> Do you wanna ask anybody if they have their committee reports? Yeah, okay. I don't think they do. We kind of did it as we I did it. Mine. Yeah. yeah. Um, next time when Martha's back, we will do it that way. So she, yes. So okay. Uh, informal reports, Superintendent. Uh, yes. Um, so I uh, shared with uh, with you uh, a draft of the priorities with some of the mm -hmm. focus areas mm -hmm. for each of the priorities that all the divisions contributed to, um, and uh, we'll soon be uploading that to the uh, website mm -hmm. so that when you click on a priority, those bullets will pop up, okay? okay? Mm -hmm. And our hope in the future is that we'll even have a little descriptor mm -hmm. of which, what, every, which, what each one of those means and to interpret it mm -hmm. for everyone. But I uh, really wanna say um, uh, that uh, it's an incredible effort what's gone on this year with, actually the last years, with the review of instructional materials, okay? Um, Language arts is going well. It's a behemoth of an adoption mm -hmm. with a lot of choices for instructional staff, for teachers. And uh, I don't know uh, if uh, the general public knows this, but teaching is all about decision making and when to make decisions about what to do what for each child. And that's where planning really comes into play in knowing how to use all the materials and knowing how to use them with fidelity to the science that they've been designed to be implemented. It's a, it's a, it's not science and it's an art all together. So the wonders pro, pro, uh, implementation is incredible and as, as is the math. Um, same standards, so we're all still teaching the same stuff and I think everybody understands that it's not the materials that are driving the changes but the standards now and uh, a different set of materials now that support those standards. Mm -hmm. So we teach the state standards, and uh, the, that is the curriculum. The state selects the curriculum, and then we write units of study for those standards and, and throughout the, the, the I think uh, I would uh, dare to say that the elementary math materials are as much a behemoth oh, yes. <laughs> as uh, English language arts. So my hat's off to the teachers who did all the work last year and decided which materials will be best to support our students. Mm -hmm. um, also want to commend the Ed Division, uh, you know, all the way from uh, Mr. Lee Sung, who made sure everybody had their fingerprints and handprints all over that process. Uh, and really, uh, the poor guy who was caught in uh, <laughs> the middle, more to say, or actually in the vortex of the funnel, <laughs> and that's John Drake, who, uh, you know, uh, who puts the pedal to the metal <laughs> in this uh, and, you know, takes feedback from the teachers as well as uh, listens to uh, central office staff about focus and uh, making sure we're teaching the right things. And then uh, I think that pretty soon we'll be able to make a real significant stride on focusing on our milestones. Most importantly, make sure all third graders read at grade level. <laughs> um, I know it sounds like it should be easy, but those of us that have been in the classroom and have had to deal with students who have uh, significant challenges at home, you know, either homeless or poverty or learning a new language or a new culture, um, uh, they come four to five years behind their, their, their middle class peers. And that's a lot of time for, it to expect the teacher to make up in one year. It's not really possible, but we can do it over a series of three or four years. And our goal is to make sure that once they get here in kindergarten, mm -hmm. that we get them to speed by third grade. So I really think uh, there are a lot of pieces in, uh, in place, and now we just have to get, uh, allow our teachers to really hone their craft, as they will, uh, as they've proven so many times before. So uh, hats off to the Ed Division for this huge, huge task. And then, you know, if it wasn't enough torture, John's kicked off a middle school math materials adoption. <laughs> 
and it's great to hear it from them and from uh, everybody else. But they're excited. They are you know? excited. And, they are. and uh, I, you know, you see the bags on their eyes yes. from all the hours they're putting in and supporting everybody. But they really have a smile on their face because they know it's good work that they're pursuing. Is that true, John? <laughs> okay, Miss okay. Olson. Yes, I'd just like to share with you. In November, we started the Classified Leadership Institute. Mm -hmm. And I did not want to forget about our Certificated Leader in Institute, which mm -hmm. is alive and well, and it started in December in its second year. The Certificated is a two-year program, whereas the Classified is a one-year program. And this just seems very appropriate for me to share tonight that John Drake kicked it off with the title of Embracing Conflict and Motivating Others. It just seems to fit with the adoptions that he's working through and sharing his expertise with others. So, um, and next, this month, um, Annette will be sharing within the series as well about managing communication because this is a certificated group. Mm -hmm. And then classified will continue at the end of the month as well. So both institutes alive and well. We are getting fantastic feedback from the classified. Um, well, I don't know if I would credit the institute with this, but one of the participants had shared that she believes she was better prepared for an interview and therefore mm -hmm. believes that's why she received the position in our classified group. I feel like the group is dwindling. Be maybe we're doing such a fine job, <laughs> or maybe they're just fantastic, very talented people, um, because Mia King and Danny Valenzuela happen to be within this cohort, and so sometimes we see them and sometimes we don't, because as you know, they were selected as administrators and have that role, but they do join us and add a nice twist to the group, mm -hmm. so we continue on building the leadership within the district. Great. Mr. Holcomb? No report. Okay. Mr. Trader. Last week, the uh, governor <coughs> released his uh, initial 2018-19 budget. And uh, there's, uh, we look forward to bringing that to you in detail as we uh, cover the second interim. But so far, it looks like it's uh, fairly favorable to education in general. He uh, actually uh, uh, funds the LCFF funding formula completely, which is about two years ahead of schedule, which is really great news. And uh, there's some, some one-time uh, help for us. And so we'll, we look forward to bringing that to you at the second interim. Good. Thank you. No report. Mm -hmm. Just a quick mid-year update on uh, professional development for our principals this year at the elementary level. Um, we, uh, we finished up the year knowing that we're going to be uh, focused on implementing the Bridges Program for Mathematics and the Wonders Program for English Language Arts. And we put together a plan in regards to professional development for our teachers. And our teachers are doing amazing work with uh, implementing the two sets of materials. But we also realized there was a need to support principals with professional development. So uh, we uh, worked with principals at the end of the year and decided that we're going to focus on the role of listening and speaking. And that plays out both in the Bridges program and in the Wonders program. And, uh, it's, it was real, it's, and we've already um, we've contracted and we've had three meetings so far. We've worked in regards to the mathematics program. We're working with the Orange County Department of Education, the same uh, ladies that are working with us to uh, help with the work that John Drake is doing with piloting of materials. They're helping us with uh, implementing or understanding the role of listening and speaking and what that can look like in the classroom for the Bridges program. When it comes to mm -hmm. the Wonders program, we've contracted with the California Reading and Literacy Project out of UCI. And they've been very helpful. So we've had three meetings so far, two on math and two on English language arts. And we're really trying to identify and support our principals with three things. The first one being uh, having a solid, deep understanding and everyone deepening their understanding of the role of listening and speaking. What does it look like in the standards? What does it look like in the framework that outlines how to uh, address listening and speaking. When, what does the research say in regards to the, the critical aspects of listening and speaking? So that's the first area. Uh, the second one is, uh, was, is, our, is a very specific request from the principals to be able to identify in the Wonders materials and in the Bridges materials where is it that listening and speaking is prominent and where is it that it's playing out and 
throughout the lesson, where is it that um, there should be uh, a strong focus on it. So we're, we're working on that. And then the final one um, really is looking at um, what should listening and speaking look like in the classroom. On a surface level, when you see listening and speaking happening in the classroom with students, you might think, oh yeah, students are collaborating, students are talking, but there really is an art to helping uh, set up the classroom in a way where you're listening and speaking is occurring at very deep levels so students can understand um, uh, at a high level the standards of listening and speaking. So it's just been really good. We're continuing our uh, support to the principals and we're getting good feedback on it and we're gonna continue that throughout uh, the rest of the year to continue to help support uh, the professional development of our principals. That's great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, share with the board uh, a conference that uh, several people from our district were able to attend. We had approximately 20 people, teachers, TOSAs, and the entire administrative team in the Ed Division uh, got to go to this conference. And it was the California STEAM conference. Hmm. And what was particularly interesting about this conference is I got to go with it. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it was a great experience and something we chose to do as a team because we wanted to make sure that we um, kept innovation, creativity, and STEAM at the forefront of our planning, uh, not only today, but in the, in the future. Um, it, was, it was a great conference. Uh, we got to see many different types of sessions of ways to create access and equity in the area of STEAM. Uh, we, we were able to see many innovative ways that uh, schools and including our district it does as well is utilizing and accessing STEAM for our students through a variety of mediums and I particularly went to one that was music how do we teach STEAM through music uh, how do we teach STEM through sports was another mm -hmm. session uh, game development there are many many ways that uh, you know schools and, and uh, districts are now utilizing to access STEAM uh, to all of our students um, and, and we saw some fabulous keynote speakers. Uh, the <laughs> first one was the commander of several space shuttle missions, including the final space shuttle mission uh, with Endeavor, uh, Mark Kelly, a fascinating oh, wow. speaker, and talking about how he got to where he is and, and really one of the powerful messages. It's not where you begin, because he had very difficult beginnings, but it's where you end up, and it gives hope to all of our uh, students. Uh, another was an Emmy Award winning filmmaker and how powerful film can be to change the world. Uh, another was a game developer from uh, USC and all the cognitive type of activities that you need to develop a powerful game. Uh, and the last one was very inspirational. This is a gentleman who uh, calls himself a learning scientist or a health <laughs> innovator. And his big claim to fame is that he created the concept of a mobile maker space mm. for children who are bound to hospitals. Mm. And normally they're sitting in a hospital room, sitting there mm. absolutely bored. But they, uh, when they are engaged in creative, innovative activity through the use of this mobile maker space area, they heal better and they're happier and time goes by. And it was a very inspirational session. It was an outstanding conference and I was just happy to participate with not only our team in the Ed Division, but also several other teachers from our district. Wow, sounds great. Yeah. As you may know, one of the uh, hallmarks in a diagnosis of autism is the struggle that students have with social skills. And we also know that social skills are important in students who have anxiety or depression. And so uh, at the start of January, we were able to bring 80 of our staff, our speech pathologists, psychologists, occupational therapists, social workers, and autism teachers, and we had a three-day training with them on the, it's called PEERS training, and it's Program for the Education and Enrichment of Relational Skills. And this is a standard um, kind of a curriculum that they follow um, out of, it was developed out of UCLA. So it's really a researched base. They have different lessons for kids and different things. So um, after you go through this three-day training, and it's very um, 
specific in terms of you have to be there at a certain time and sign in, you can't leave early, mm. if you leave early, you know, this is all of what the trainer says in order for them to have um, fidelity to their um, credentialing of this. So um, as of this week, we have 80 of our staff who are certified as wow. peers, um, trained folks, and they will take that information back and use it in the classroom, um, you know, during occupational therapy. They'll use it, our social workers will use it when they're counseling kids with anxiety and depression. Um, so it's a, it was a, a, a great opportunity for them to, um, to get something that we think is going to impact a lot of students. Wow. Great. Thank you. Dana has, Dana has her light on, and so do you. Oh. Okay, oh, Ms. Black. Oh, I was just going to comment. Um, you just made my day, the fact that you and the Ed Division got to go to STEAM. Because I've been, I've had the luxury of being able to go for three or four years, and I know Char has been in training as well. Yeah. And it's really hard to come home by yourself, and no <laughs> one else got to go there and play with those toys and visit with those school districts. And so they also have the car. I don't know. Um, I think it's coming up in February, where they're actually going to do the car building at UCI. You know, and and we have you know. Um, districts in that I'll get the information and send it out. I sent it up to you last time, but I think if you're excited about that, that <laughs> is really exciting, because I got to go last year as well. But this is where our students are building cars alongside <coughs> with car makers in the universities, and, um, and our students are beating them. Actually, some of our high schools have, bet, have beat the colleges you know, on that. And so it's really exciting and um, to go. And it's hard, like I said, to come back and be the only one. And poor Dr. Navarro, I'm like, you will not believe what I just experienced. <laughs> and the good news is he's experienced it also. So it's been great. So congratulations. And so we're going to get the whole board to go next year. It would be, it would be really fun. I mean, it, it, it's just amazing. But that's the future. That's where we're headed. And our students are letting us know loud and clear. So. Absolutely. So I'm glad you had a great time. That's great. Ms. Matoye. Um, Dr. Jockum. <laughs> um, Newport Mesa is always, we've had so many, so many of these programs for the peer relationships. We started developing because there was a giant vacuum. And so I'm excited to hear that UCLA's got the product. Were we able to come back and debrief on how much of it we're doing, or how we could, how utilize some of what we have. I know that we had really good stuff, but it, it was self-developed, and sort of like when the standards come out brand new, we have to do baby steps, and I'm excited. <coughs> so I just wondered how, how, how it meshed. Well, what they're going to be able to do is each of these groups meets individually. So your social workers all meet mm -hmm. together and your psychologists. That's the opportunity that they're going to have to say, how does this fit into what we've already been doing? And again, you know, we've had a lot of staff turnover. That's true. Um, so we have some people who have kind of the, uh, the history and what the district has done before and self-developing some of these things. But we want everybody to kind of be on the same page and start with all of this um, uh, research-based materials and move on. That's so it's excellent. not to disregard what they did oh, before, no. but to mm -hmm. kind of take it and infuse it with this. Right. Oh, no. I, I figured that we laid the groundwork just for the fact that this we needed to do this and then to actually have the next level and how it augmented. And perfect. Great. Thank you. Okay. Any more comments from anyone? Okay. Then um, we, yeah. I move adjournment. Second. In the name of Jess Gilman and Mary Zilgit. Mm -hmm. Second. I second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Safe out there. <laughs>